My name is Willie Sun. I'm simply a humble scientist who tried to learn the truth, as uh, Jane has encouraged all of us to do. And uh, I'm here to try to talk about a subject that I, that actually Jane picked for me because I given a preliminary talk uh, maybe in December of 2016 in Washington, D.C. And uh, I say that I should not speak on it again, but then this is one of the better forums because they only given me 15 minutes and I have a, my lifetime story to tell. So please allow me 60 minutes on this one. Franklin, Dr. Jerry Arnett is here. See? <laughs> Good to see you, Jerry. Anyway, uh, it's a serious matter. We're dealing with a, a war now that is really apparently completely being hoodwinked by all these strange people out there, strange war out there that is trying to kill science essentially. So I would dare to try to propose here that we should call for a disestablishment of science actually, to separate science from government as much as we can, right? So this is one of the things, team that actually passion that uh, consume me for a very long time now. But here is the reason why we need to do that. Think about it. You got guys trying to sell you sugar without carbons. <laughs> I mean, it's all this endless stuff. These people, as you all may know, there is this big climate march in Washington, D.C. around April, end of April of uh, this year. They're talking about people's climate march and think about the issues that they're trying to fight for. I can't read it here too well. Every single one of them has nothing to do with climate. It's about social justice, builders of democracy, guardians of the future, so on and so forth. And then we have our National Academy of Science, supposedly the nation's most prestigious scientific institution. By the way, seriously aside, it is supposed to be a very prestigious institution. I would say that outright now. In fact, I've said it many times. If you say that NAS is kind of still respectable, I would say not so. It's actually it's not even 99% uh, uh, corrupted. It's actually 100%. That's the problem. And they've been trying to tackle this global uh, climate change issue. They have like Q&A, okay, because in case you're so dumb to study the topic, here's a question they set up for you. If the emission of greenhouse gas were to stop, would the climate return to the condition of 200 years ago? First of all, who wants to return to the climate 200 years ago? They set that up themselves. They actually say no, okay? Think about it politically. They're saying that you, whatever you do now, you cut this thing, you will never cool the climate. Excuse me, so what are we doing that for? It's like saying that you have a headache and then they want to chop off your arm and your legs and then maybe your legs too, you know? God, these people are really dangerous. And this is because it was based on a very false notion. The false notion is that it's only the carbon dioxide that was emitted by this called anthropogenic component, man-made stuff, like we're using it for electricity, for driving our cars, cook our food, right? They say that this particular kind of carbon, it goes up into the atmosphere, you know what? It's going to stay there almost forever, 10,000 years and stuff like that. Of course, we are scientists. Guys like Art Robinson, Noah Robinson could have figured that out long ago. In fact, it was in our global warming petition stuff. We actually discussed the issue. But then lately, this great man from Germany, Professor Hermann Hardy, I actually are very lucky to make a friend of him right now. He actually just published a paper that is very powerful in my opinion. And of course, his final statement is that the average uh, resident lifetime of carbon dioxide is only four years, or else the whole system wouldn't work, believe me. You know, you accumulate too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, essentially. So think about it. I mean, these are real science. I mean, come on, if he's not right, let's debate this issue. Of course, you won't debate this issue because you know what? They are always right. This is the kind of problem in science now, right? We have political activism. Our National Academy of Science, instead of talking about science, they are pro promoting that you should take more chili sauce and then a smoke pot actually to try to make your guts better. <laughs> and then you got this religious aspect. I hope some of you know who this guy is, Professor Rajendra Chuchu Pachari. He is from India. By the way, he was the IPCC chairman for a very long time, at least 10 years, okay? I mean, this is one of his resignation letter, which he said that it is his, uh, it's not his mission, it's, it's actually a form of religion. I still recall very vividly when some of us convinced uh, the late uh, Michael Crichton, I hope some of you know these fictional uh, writers, uh, MD, PhD from Harvard and all that, you know, fellow at Cambridge University, a smart man, who actually exposed the scam of this global warming stuff, writing a book called The State of Fear. When we convinced him to, to actually testify in the US Senate, EPW, he did it one time. The second time when we wrote email to request for him to do it again, he said no, because it's a religion. So you can't argue with religion. So. so these people are really getting more and more stuff. I mean, more and more activism going around, right? In fact, 
you guys may know some of the one of the famous guy who actually shot some of our congressmen were, were in some of this uh, meeting and then you got these little kids who say that God actually drowned the last group of uh, climate change deniers, right? This is the kind of language that they are pulling that is very dangerous in that sense. And then, of course, they are saying that Washington, D.C. is going to look like this if you keep emitting that. For guys like uh, Jerry Arnett or, or, or Dennis Mitchell, we will have a Montonian or, or Trump kind of thing. What is the problem? <laughs> it's, a, it's the best way to drain out the swamp, in a sense. And then you got our Professor Barack Obama. By the way, he just gained this new title. You all know that he has uh, actually worried about re climate refugee for the future. It's going to be so dangerous. Because he just published a paper in Science Magazine. He's to tell you that, you know, how, how, how the clean energy, so-called clean energy, how do you clean the energy? I don't even have the idea, actually. So they've been really using some very strange language. He actually managed to publish a paper in Science Magazine before he uh, came out from the office. That's really, a, a, again, you can bet that this paper, is this, is this peer review or power review, guys? <laughs> Indeed, he's giving a word to himself. <laughs> but joking aside, this is the kind of uh, rhetoric that they are putting out, right? This guy, I guess you all know his name, James Hodgkinson, really talking about we are being the mean people. Look at himself on his mugshot. I mean, these people are really dangerous people. They actually execute their fantasy out of uh, in actual action. Because it does happen in Alabama, two of our great colleagues, Professor John uh, Christie and uh, Roy Spencer at the University of Alabama, Huntsville, there are people actually shooting at the window of their offices, okay? I hope the FBI will really uh, find these people and actually prosecute them. You can do that, boy. So they are actually doing things like that is somewhat dangerous. And then we got another kind of problem in science. Instead of science, actually, we're talking about scientism. We're worshipping all these non-scientists, guys like, uh, who's this guy? This is the Virgin Ed, chief guy, right? Who's saying something that's completely meaningless and we're still cheering. Right? A world free of climate change. Imagine that, guys. Can you imagine that? A world free of climate change? I'm going to do some moonwalk after this. Oh, boy. He really can say something very profound while holding his breath, right? He don't like CO2 so much, he's going to stop breathing. And then you got the famous guy. I guess you all know who this guy is, right? Bill Nye. Jane was talking about this attack on uh, you know, our, our identity, being a male and female. This is a guy who won Emmy Award for saying that there is no binary... Male and female is actually a spectrum of sexual, you know, orientation. A spectrum, you know, very scientific, but completely baloney. But that's the world we live in. And then we got the problem of scientism. These are so-called scientists who actually are not practicing science. They're actually singing along, doing all the bad stuff. I mean, saying all this crazy stuff that I have no basis in, 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 in points, actually. Saying that if you have, a, what, four degree... Here, 4 degrees, we're not sure whether it's Celsius or Fahrenheit, but he really means anything, and it could be 50% of species extinction. And then you got this celebrity uh, scientist. This is actually one of my nemesis. His name is Professor Michael Mann from uh, University, uh, Penn, uh, Penn State University. He's actually uh, fancy himself being uh, put on this sort of thing, and uh, he is somewhat famous right now because uh, he can speak in a rally in Buffalo, and then his name is being worshipped in D.C. Good for him. And then, of course, he has the delusion somehow that, you know, he can be in the class of Rachel Carson. He's so proud of it. You all know, right, for this crowd, everybody know that Rachel Carson is actually one of the big criminals in the sense, right? Because her, her own psychosis of caused people to write this book called Silent Spring to try to actually attempt to ban the DDT. And that ban has caused a lot of death in Africa and India and all these places, right? This is the kind of unspeakable crime that they're doing. And then, of course, these clever people even say that even Hitler have not doubted the climate change. <laughs> we must be really the, the cream de la cream to, to, to be really at this status. By the way, there's another very serious problem that just came out. This is something wrong with our science, by the way. Instead of judging your science proposal by the content, guess what the problem is in some of the colleagues that we just heard? Nine proposals submitted by one institution to NASA got rejected, not because of the science content, because the font size was not good, was not fitting the criteria they set up. <laughs> you know, you really have to shake your head. I mean, for kids, please, be careful. This is the kind of very bad thing that we should not call science. This is why I'm going to propose to NSF tomorrow. By the way, I already write up all the proposal. I'm going to send this page from The Onion, saying that give me $50 billion, and we're going to have this machine that generates science itself. All right? Let's see if they fund me. 
And then you got more problem. Another problem is this famous, uh, uh, what you call gatekeeper of the climate change business, right? It's not science, by the way. This is called the IPCC. For those of us who don't know, it's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You get one of these co-chair of science by the name of uh, Dr. Valerie Masson de Mort, who actually trying to propose this handling of languages. Matt, we need your help, Matt. <laughs> we really need your help to educate them on all this. They're creating all this strange stuff and robbing the language. So my only question for them is that how do you compute the probability of a claim of a statement when you don't even know the probability distribution? How do you even quantify an unquantifiable proposition? But these people are actively doing this sort of thing, changing language and making all this false claim that trying to give them legitimacy. But more seriously is actually a paper that this person, Valerie uh, Delmont Masson, is actually just associated with uh, Professor Jim Hansen from uh, Columbia University. He's actually a former NASA GIS uh, employee. And they actually just published a paper that want us to pay $535 trillion, guys, for the carbon sin that we, we promote. And then, of course, ask yourself a question. If an IPCC co-chair writing a paper like this, what hope do we have if we don't fire her or whatever? Let her be not associated with this group, man. Why do you even read IPCC report? And of course, it is always us who have to write the counter rebuttal, point by point by point. point. By the way, I have done this at least know, a few thousand times, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not the very first time in the rodeo. <laughs> and then we got this guy, the current uh, IPCC, uh, uh, not IPCC, the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Study uh, Director. His name is Dr. Gavin Schmidt. He actually trying to tell us that, you know what? All the climate change that we have seen is greater than 100% caused by man. Can you believe that it's caused by greater than 100%? <laughs> you guys know that is his contribution, actually, his special gift to science. How would that work? How do you explain that? By the way, I always like this blogger. This blogger by the name of Sharp Nugaras, I think he's in some Indian descent. He's either in America or that. He said, the reason that why you get 100% is that because human cost 2,000%. And then the sulfate aerosol, which is also human component, costs only 1,900%. So if you take 2,000% minus 1,900, Franklin, where is it? 100%, right? Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Jesus. And then you have this kind of stuff. They are so proud of it. By the way, these people are not only keeping quiet. They are selling this sort of stuff. This is Columbia University, one of those prestigious universities who's promoting that they're going to have a new climate services product. One of the products is actually to tell you how much mud you get on your shoes or your, your, your dogs walking out, right? This is really, really crazy stuff. And then there's really, this is newspaper from New Orleans talking about her pet turtle is hungry and is a proof of global warming. <laughs> this is really human psychosis to the extreme. And then you have this, this story about Actually, even the songbirds who stop eating all this, uh, the, the eating habit will be affected by global warming because you know why? Because the leaves that actually have high concentration on, concentrate, uh, uh, concentrate on CO2 doesn't taste as good. So the, the songbird will get hungry and probably they'll die, die down by maybe silent spring coming again. If it's not the DDT, it will be the, the highly enriched uh, CO2 in, the, in this leaf that is causing the problem. Then we got Ben Franklin here. Is that you, Ben and Franklin? Did you? Did you give this, uh, this idea of useful knowledge? So we want to raise the name of Ben Franklin being the founder of the University of Pennsylvania, saying that, you know, you really should be more humble about science. You know, we have to be practical about this. So he actually proposed the notion of, of actually useful knowledge, you know, by actually applying the scientific principle to the study of important problems. Okay, of course, the, the real Ben Franklin is this one. <coughs> This is why I would propose, if you really deny scientific principle, you can really obtain any numbers, in fact, infinite numbers of paradoxes, right? Is that a true statement? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, those guys get more and more nasty. I'm not going to talk too much about myself, obviously, but then this is the kind of stuff you see on the internet, right? Because we are still refusing to see global warming when there is no global warming. I guess we are right, after all. And then they put up stuff like this. Emily, did you see daddy like this? They say that daddy is stealing so much money. Okay, saying that I'm taking money and then I'll change my mind if you give me a few, few million dollars. It's not going to happen, believe me. <laughs> and then all these nasty people, you know, doing that sort of stuff. Not so free, really. 
This is why I wanted to proudly show this stuff. If, if you really want to claim that it's really soon, I hope all of you is going along with me, right? Can we? In case they are looking for me, I say look for some of you. Jesu really soon. So here, here's our author. This is all my co-authors. You can see. Sally Balunas is one of the famous guys, one of the famous uh, people in DDP conference. She is the one that who brought me here. These are all my colleagues all over the world who have written paper with me. We work very, very nicely. We really, really are very happy with our scientific works. And uh, really, really amazing kind of luck to be able to work with all these great scientists around the, all over the world that we're trying our best to at least clean the sign up and in the sense that don't get so confused by all these political uh, uh, interferences. So one more thing to say is that I'm so scary. In fact, I steal this uh, frog from Al Gore's house. <laughs> Almost there to, to where I'm come about to talk about. So what is really important in science, obviously, is seeking truth, isn't it? To speak about all these other troubles, all this mess, whatever the personal problem you may have. This is why a quote from Freeman Dyson, I hope all of you know Professor Freeman Dyson from Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. He did make a very nice quote uh, on, on my behalf in that sense because the reporter was trying to find some kind of scrap uh, on how bad Willie Soon is, but then I guess the great man didn't, <laughs> he can see in between all the lies, right? So he actually said that, you know, the point of science is to question accepted dogma. In that res that for that reason, he respects Willie Soon as a good scientist and courageous uh, citizen. All right, now I'm going to come to the main beef of what I'm talking about. I'm going to address three cases that actually happened to me personally. It's not so personal, by the way. It's, it's a way to try to illustrate how bad science has been. If, because if you don't see this example, you know, you, you just cannot imagine how worse can it get. Actually, it gets to the worst possible. The first case is about a paper that I published in a journal called Climate Research, and then how all those editor-in-chief, and including even this guy, Michael Mann, was trying to attempt to censor us. Essentially, this is censorship, really. And then the incidence of a last-minute cancellation of a session, that a scientific session that we have proposed and then accepted by American Geophysical Union, AGU, in 2009. And then all of a sudden, they say, you know, your, 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 your meeting is kind of uh, not suitable for us, so we decided to cancel you. And, uh, and then finally, our nation most prestigious, did I say most prestigious again? That word don't mean anything to, to, to NAS, by the way. The proceeding of National Academy of Science attempted to bully, for example, Willie Soon myself. And then I'll show you an example of how Michael Mann has misbehaved over and over and over again. So the first story. In 2003, actually step back, 2001, 2002. During that time, if any of you, doesn't matter, Willie Soon, it can be Jim Armstrong, can be Art Robinson, could be, you know, Paul Dreesen, whoever wants to write a paper on climate uh, history. If you don't cite a paper called uh, Man, Bradley and Hughes, either 98, 1998 in Nature or 1999 in Geophysical Research Letter, if you don't cite that positively, all the peer-reviewed stuff is actually coming back as warning. If you don't cite this stuff, you know, you won't get paper uh, accepted. This is the kind of stuff they're putting, hiding behind all this, uh, what you call the traditional science rule. So I decided to write a paper. So by 2002, I have a good draft, and then we submitted, and then we got a paper accepted in climate research. The reason why I let it get accepted is that I will explain what the difference is. Actually, we published two versions, one in climate research, one in energy and environment. But after our paper got published in climate, change, uh, climate research, look, at least five editors resigned claiming that we have produced a bad paper, it's so bad, but you can see it has nothing to do with science, by the way, to date. There is still no credible attack on that paper, zero. All they claim is that, oh, because uh, the paper was uh, quickly noticed by President Bush, which is actually, I'm not even a friend of President Bush, who cares? But anyway, he was talking about this in his cabinet meeting and people got really surprised, you know, why is this paper so important? It is important in the sense that we, sh we say that the climate change, natural variability is kind of large. It's not just because of 20th century, when men come along, you get the blade of the hockey stick, right? So that, that's a controversy that they were trying to create. But you know what? If you ask yourself, if this sort of intimidation, it just happened to Willie Soon, then it must be a problem of Willie Soon, isn't it? If it's just a unique case. Unfortunately, it happened all over the place. Here, I'll just pick two examples because these are two very distinguished persons. The first guy is Dr. Roy Spencer. He published a paper 
uh, in remote sensing, I believe, and uh, basically talking about how climate sensitivity should work. This is the idea that if you double carbon dioxide in the amount, how much warming would you get? He find a very low number. Instead of three or four or five degrees, he found basically like one degree Celsius. So those guys were very unhappy because it's not alarming enough. So they actually have editor resign, Roy Spencer. And then you have another guy. You may not know his name. It's Professor Shinyu Ichi Akasofu. He's actually a good man. Professor Fred Singer obviously know Akasofu very, very well. And here's Akasofu. He's actually a very, very good physicist. He's an, actually a physicist specialized in study of aurora. You all know this, this aurora borealis in the southern hemisphere too, right? Where all the color dancing in the sky. This is related to a region called magnetosphere, right? Where the magnetic field in relation to all the airs, you know, the, the oxygen and nitrogen up in the air that can create colors when you have activities from the sun, solar wind doing it. In fact, it's so prestigious that Shinuichi Akasufu has a building named after him in you know, see Alaska Fairbank. But it doesn't matter how prestigious you are, I'm sure Frank Tipler will be attacked too if you say something about it. Everybody get, get this kind of slap. Uh, Singer, Professor Singer, of course, they attack him like mad. There's no doubt about that. So this is actually the, the, the legacy of uh, Akasufu. By the way, he's still around, of course, very active, still writing stuff. But he rightly, mainly, mainly he writes on Aurora stuff now, so he don't write on climate change that much anymore. And now let's talk about that climate research case. This is actually a case where they actually took all my peer review stuff, which have never happened before. They never asked for my permission to examine the peer review process. The editor-in-chief or the, the publisher released all this stuff. But then once they look through it, they check. They realize that everything that I do follow the proper procedure. There was a, there was a review. We answer, and then there was a rebuttal. We review again, and then all got accepted fairly and squarely. There were three or four reviewers. But the problem here is, let me explain. But anyway, before I explain that, I have to tell you. So there's this guy by the name of Professor Han von Storch from Germany. He decided that we have crossed the line. Okay? And he decided that we should be banned forever from publishing in this journal. Okay? And to show you who Hans von Storch is, that's who he is. I'm sorry that I have to show faces now. I hope he's watching this video, by the way. If there's anything to challenge, just come and speak to me straight face to face. But the problem is, the, the reason why they actually was trying to give me so much trouble is that they just got an inquiry from uh, US uh, Senate EPW, environmental whatever, power and whatever, W means work, public work, yeah. And they got a request to find out how the peer review process worked in climate research. And he categorically wanted to kick me out and say that how bad I am and so on and so forth, right? So he immediately got panicked and, uh, because he, I guess he never received a letter from a Senate office before. So he immediately got excited and wanted to issue an editorial basically saying how bad I am and we should be not publishing in that journal anymore. Now, it's my side of the story, right? You all heard the Von Storch and all this climate research. This is the actual paper that we published, uh, Soon and Balunas, in, published in January of 2003. And then, later on, I decided to ask help from uh, Craig Itso. Craig Itso, you're here, okay? And David Legates and uh, his father, Sherwood Itso. By the way, this is the only time I get to publish with Sherwood Itso. We used to have one paper that was with his name on it, but then there was all this censorship coming, he has to drop his name, okay? Anyway, we publish, I published two versions. Let me explain now why the two versions. Here's the reason. In fact, the first, first version from climate research is a pure hoax. Okay? I rarely say this in public. This is basically the second time you ever heard this. It's a hoax because during the peer review process, guess what? The paper is close to about 60 pages in print. They, they ask us to take off 40 pages and say you can only publish these 20 pages or else we won't publish. Hey, I decided to play a trick on them. At that time, I, I guess by 2003, I was mature enough. By the way, I was never mature enough. But <laughs> I decided that I'm going to pull a hoax on them. So I decided that, okay, good. I'll let you have the 20 pages. The reason why they don't want that is because that 40 pages is criticism of this paper by the name of Man Bradley and Hughes, 1999. So I say, go, go ahead. I'm going to do that because I'm fed up with this sort of censorship and I want to tell the world about this. So I hope all of you can tell people about this sort of thing. It is the truth. I have all the emails to verify everything. Obviously, Michael Mann is not approving of my behavior, right? He's very mad. He said, this is a crap. This is the worst of the worst. And, uh, you know, it should never be published. We shouldn't even respond to it. That sort of stuff, right? And then 
he actually somehow was able to coordinate with New York Times, Scientific American, and all those other journalists trying to expose me. This guy is a very, very shrewd guy, okay? He somehow have contact with all of these people. I don't even know how he know that. By the way, if you don't know where the origin of this sort of statement is, it's actually from all the emails that were released during Climate Gate, during uh, around November of 2009, okay? Before the Copenhagen uh, uh, powwow they have in, in of IPCC. That was a very unsuccessful convention, and then they got successful in uh, Paris, which is uh, 2015. So now, this is the kind of rhetoric, right? If you don't believe in uh, denying uh, climate change, suck my hockey sticks, right? And then you got this guy by the name of Professor Tom Wigley, trying to call us names. We are not astrophysicists, we are not astronomy, we're not even good in astronomy, so we should be astrologists. And then he worry about legal position, which I explained in another quote. And what you can see is that they were very worried. They were worried that in case we are actually good enough to be publishing in an astrophysical journal, for example, which of course we publish routinely when it's necessary. When you have done science, it's all about that, right? You're not there to show off, I have 1,000 paper, I have 200. No, it's about how good that one paper is. I only write paper when I need to write it, that's all. And they were playing this kind of game. Obviously, this is what you call the standard Alinsky technique, right? Projection. Everything they do is actually about projection, about their own problem. Michael Mann was even accusing us for dropping our middle name when we were publishing to try to gain citation index. By the way, I swear to God, here's I swear. I have been publishing since, I don't know, 1985. I have never looked at my citation index. I really don't get, give a damn about those sort of things. You just publish paper. That's all it is. Right? If people cite it, cite it. If you don't cite it, it's your loss, I guess. If I'm wrong, I'll correct myself this minute. By the way, who is Tom Wigley? Okay? He's, he's also worried about that because they were actively trying to tell all the rest of the climate community, don't publish in climate research anymore. Let's ban this journal. Because you know why they were able to publish paper like Willie Soon's in, in the journal, right? So that's what they do, that kind of thing. They, but then you say, do we, should we have a legal position to, to defend this thing in case we got sued? So he's a very shrewd guy, by the way. Who is Tom Wigley? Tom Wigley actually is a very senior scientist. He took over the what you call the University of East Anglia in England, which they founded by great Professor Hubert Lamb. That guy is a great climatologist, actually. He can be said to be the father of climatology. And uh, he took over the position of Lamb, and then he essentially ruined uh, the standard of uh, East Anglia, in my opinion. But this is the kind of guy who wrote in private, making attempt to change the data according to what they like, okay? By the way, if you're familiar with temperature curve, it has a rise from 1900 to, let's say, 1940, and then it goes down a little bit to the 70s and then go up. They were worried about this going down because they couldn't explain because the CO2 change was very small from 40 to 70. It really got much more larger, changed much more larger during the end of the, let's say, 80s, right? And they wanted to make sure that this thing could be explained by also, you know, not explained by natural variability like the sun, for example. So he was actually doing things like this. So I guess you know now who Tom Wigley is, right? Not quite of a scientist, isn't it? I hope Tom Wigley hear this too, by the way. Then you understand now, what is the problem in, uh, in our paper in that published with, uh, with uh, Itso and the Gates? It's basically a guy like this from NOAA, Dr. Mark Atkin, was actually saying that, you know, they were so concerned now. The OSTP, which is the Office of Science and Technology Policy, has actually another insider, which is one of the swamp guys. This guy now had gone back to JPL. They would help him. They need to help him, so they need to dream up uh, some kind of uh, killer rebuttal to, to just really kick this uh, Willie Soon out of this planet because he's so bad, right? So they have to do that kind of stuff. Did you see? It doesn't have anything to do with science, right? They keep saying it's bad, keep saying bad, but they didn't say what, how bad it is, what bad it is. By the way, who were involved in all this emailing list? This guy like Weekly. Phil Jones, they are not so famous, but their name is not that important. Jim Hansen, for example, Ben Center, Tranberth, Tom Cow, which is actually the director of the National Climatic Data Center. And then there's the name of Ray Bradley, which I'll explain to you who he is, Mike McCracken. And then most important is Ellen Mosley Thompson, because she is the editor of EOS, the American Geophysical Union Journal, okay? That is the journal where they publish the rebuttal. In the standard science tradition, if the error, let's say, we have error in climate research, let's say, you should publish your paper in climate research. They actually look for another journal so that they could get a free pass real quick, okay? 
that I don't have the last word, that kind of stuff. It's terrible people. Here's the proof from the climate gate showing you that Mans and Phil Jones, they were colluding with this uh, uh, EOS, uh, Alan Thompson. These people may look very kind and very naive, but they are really dirty people doing bad stuff, okay? They were colluding among themselves and then quickly get the whole thing to be published, and man is so confident that it's fully acceptable and all that stuff. And then you have Ray Bradley, which is, by the way, thesis advisor for Michael Mann, so he didn't, does come from a legacy. Uh, Bradley, of course, is talking about how well-positioned he is to try to gain uh, more funding. These people are talking about me being corrupted, taking money from left and right, where they themselves guarantee all these fundings, right? For actually uh, 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 forcing our government to say, if you don't give me money, we won't give you the results, right? We're so important. And then you can see what kind of trash they put into the rebuttal, by the way. They actually, Ray Bradley is actually has some kind of conscience. So in that email, he was writing to uh, Phil Jones to try to explain that, you know, all the stuff is crap that they were putting into the, the result where they claim to be rebutting us. So they really, really was talking about all these rubbishes that they were sup not supposed to put in there. But you know what? In the end, it's the standard, what you call Alinsky technique. They group together. They hang together or, or, not, or separate, right? They, they will not do something that the Republican is very good at doing, which is fighting each other. Then they publish a curve like this in response to my, to my uh, paper. In fact, we just found out uh, some 14 years later, one of the lines there actually is not what it says. So it tells you the quality of their rebuttal is so weak that it's just crazy. These people are making political statements all over the place. I really think that the really mad man is this Michael Mann himself. So it's true that you really a cartoon would help very much for this to explain what he's doing. And then Michael Mann is very worried about how powerful Sun and Balunas is because we were able to hijack the whole Harvard University's uh, press office. Okay, he was so concerned because we are really, you know, uh, 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 putting out so much disinformation. But look who is doing the controlling. This is actually a letter of a uh, AGU press office writing to Michael Mann, Bradley, and all those guys talking about their press release on the rebuttal that they're doing. <laughs> they, they really got it all covered, put it this way. Right? They are really colluding among themselves, doing just about anything. Not even worse. You all know that how bad, how bad is uh, Willie Soon's work? Tell me. It's so bad that Tom Wigley had to tell in secret email, saying that, you know, maybe by chance that Willie Soon and all those guys would, uh, would be right. But please, shh, don't tell anyone. Tom Wigley, please, eat your own words. Not only that, you can see, even the IPCC agree with us. Because we say that the the climate variability, look in terms of temperature and precipitation, is not unusual in the last thousand years. And we show all the data. And they, their result, actually, Michael Mann hockey stick is produced by, by some kind of mathematical algorithm. And even IPCC agree with us, by the way, in the zero order draft. By the way, this statement got removed later, okay? They have, but anyway, they, 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 they are constantly playing games like this. Then you got another serious problem here. Remember, I keep telling you about power review system. It is a power review system. Because these guys are colluding among themselves. Later, I'll show you a fine example of how Michael Mann is asking Phil Jones to review Band Center and Tom Wigley paper, and then it would get approved quickly in general climate, okay? But here, Phil Jones is so bad, so worried about some of us getting in and being cited by IPCC. He said that he would change the definition of peer review, what peer review is, if necessary, okay? These people are not going to get past my my uh, serious scientific uh, eyes. This is the kind of people that actually I have no sympathy for him. By the way, he did contemplate that wanted to commit suicide. Weird guy. Yes, then we go to the next explosion, okay? By the way, this is a very interesting atmospheric phenomenon called atmospheric sprite, right? Happened in the upper atmosphere. The, the nature is truly wonderful to be studied carefully and understand it well enough to, to explain and to learn about it and the joy of science rather than just playing all these political games in and out. Here's what happened in 2009. Myself, Professor David Lagate, and Professor Sultan Hamid from uh, Stony Brook University, we decided to make a scientific session which we call Diverse View from the Galileo's Window, right? Researching factors and processes of climate change in the age of anthropogenic CO2. We proposed it around February and July, I, I, June, we started the ideas and then we wrote the proposal. The session got accepted in July 17. You can see by September 14, they were actually showing signs that they're not very happy. So they say, oh, 
We have to merge your 15 papers with another 12 papers from another colleague of ours, Nicola Sacavata. He's now at Italy. And, uh, and then they put us all in one session. So we have a session with 27 papers. And then 10 days later, they change their mind. They say that, oh, you all cannot be in this one session. We're going to split all your papers into six different groups. And then they won't even allow us oral presentation. Because I guess they worry about me talking. I'm just talking. I'm not making speeches and everything. I'm just talking. And they're so worried about that, no oral paper. And then we requested that this could not happen. What are you guys doing? And then we request for reinstatement, and then they, they, won't, they won't let us do. So the whole session was dissolved. All this is fully documented. So shame on AGUs. Let me explain now why our session. We're actually trying to tackle climate in the honest sense. Because, please, anybody know what is a climate? Please, Professor Tipler. I mean, it's not a study of the atmosphere alone. You have to study oceanography. You have to study all this other stuff. Astronomy, solar physics, geology, geochronology, geochemistry, sedimentology, tectonic, paleontology, paleoecology, glaciology, yeah, climatology, meteorology, oceanography, ecology, archaeology, and history. We want to cover this from, that's what we call it, diverse view. Okay? And they're trying to stop us. We want to explain things like this. Who are the people who planned it and what are the favorable uh, climatic conditions for these people to, to do this kind of beautiful cave painting? And here's the bullies. This is the guy who rejected us. And guess what? He claimed, if you can read some of the word, he claimed that certainly none of the abstract submissions have anything to do with the Galilean moon of Saturn. I mean, the chairman in charge of the AGU session didn't even read our proposal and saying that we are trying to talk about Galilean uh, moon of Saturn. <laughs> we were not, of course. We're trying to talk about climate. And then he was very stern. He said, no, no refund will be allowed. Okay? He was so, he was so hot-tempered, this guy. By the way, his name is Stephen Lloyd from uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Institute. So I'm sorry I have to name names. If he's not happy about it, come and see me. I'm still here. And then my friend, professor, the great professor Christopher Essex, he only spoke here at DDP once, but then his, his video is one of the very popular ones from DDP. And he should be invited back for sure. This guy is such a brilliant scientist. He actually was so mad that he has to show this proof. That what do you mean there's no travel plan or payment involved? He actually broke a hotel, booked the tickets, and then paid the payment for the abstract fees. Even the abstract fees, they say, he first say, no, we won't refund it. He's so tough, okay? This bully, no refund. Yeah, he did say that in the following up email. This guy, are you joking? Let me explain now who we invited in our session. I'm sorry, this is the best of the best, okay? We got guys like Professor Dick Linson. Uh, I can't read this one. Uh, yeah, Christopher Essex, Dick Linson, Professor of MIT, you know, uh, the world most uh, number one, I would say, in, in meteorology and climate scientists, right? He just retired. He also spoke at DTB once, so you guys can look at his talk in uh, Long Island. And then another one we have is Professor Sultan Hamid from Stony Brook. He's actually a hydrologist. And then we also have Vincent Cotillot. This is a French Academy of Science a guy, a geologist, doing great work. So he went to present a paper in our session. He couldn't present. He also had to drop out. And then who else did I get? I got another name. Yeah, this guy from uh, Denmark. And then we got, uh, let me see. Who's another guy? Yeah, Jan Haf, Germany, another good guy. And finally, Donald Turco. Donald Togo is the guy that received the highest honor from AGU uh, uh, medal, the Fleming medal. Fred Singer would know about this sort of thing. I mean, these guys also want to come to our session, and yet, guess what they say? You cannot make a session that is, quote-unquote, somewhat skeptical of this climate change business, right? That was my attempt, by the way. After that, of course, I dropped my membership. I, I would never join this kind of group again. I would only join, I take that back, I joined it only to get cheaper registration fees to save money, because I don't have money. Now, we come with uh, my own personal trouble. Since about 2004, I have followed my great mentor to try to not, public, not to get money from government anymore. It's actually happened because of one incident. I submitted a very good proposal to NASA. It got rated F with no reason. And I got a really great project, actually. One of these very, very good projects. And they just didn't want to fund it. Have no reason. They just rejected it. Worse yet, they even make me go and review some other, some other stuff which actually, of course, uh, I did declare that I have a proposal in this. They still wanted me to review some, some of this NASA proposal. And after that, I just say, I'm not going to take another dime from the government. So, but then I have another internal problem. Even if I take money from the private uh, foundation, 
in starting 2012, I am not allowed to do sun climate research. That is the problem that I have right now, and it's still ongoing. So in that sense, most of my climate work now are all basically self-funded, self on my own time. My wife can tell you how many hours I sleep a night. So we published this note in 2015, I forget what year, 2015, I think, yeah. It's in Proceeding on National Academy of Science. By the way, I really don't care where you publish this thing. It's just that the paper is so bad that myself, David Legates, and this, this amateur scientist who also speak three times, I think, in this meeting, DDP, Willie Session Buck, we actually found something wrong with the paper that was being published in PNAS. So as a scientist, what do you do? You cry or you complain or you shout, nothing. You write a scientific proper, just a short letter to say, okay, here's what's wrong. Okay, they published this. Okay, that's fine. Guess what happened? Problem with really soon is always not about science, okay? Look at what she's complaining. Now they send me a very stern warning letter from the editor-in-chief of the <laughs> National Academy of Science, this medical doctor from, from Scripps. I think he's from Salk Institute, Salk Institute in, uh, in UCSD. Claiming that uh, he even know better because he read it from New York Times. Willie Soon is so corrupted that we're going to put a yellow star on your paper, on your jacket. He said that there would be a correction published for this paper because I have not disclosed the funding that I was sponsored by Southern Company for this paper. You know, I have written him about <laughs> six times and then I got all my colleagues writing paper to, to, to this guy, okay? Several times. He refused to listen, they just sent me the letter say they want to do this. It won't work, by the way. They don't, they don't respect this kind of uh, decency and normal talk. I could ask Phelan to write, it won't matter, sorry. It will only matter when you get lawyers. These are my three great heroes, actually. These are, usually I don't like lawyers as much, but these three lawyers work for me, by the way, pro bono. They've been saving my, my butts really a lot. They've been trying to come after me, trying to get me on doing all the bad things, but these three lawyers sent a very stern warning letter to him <coughs> that Willie Soon has never received money from Southern Company. All the funding I got go into the Smithsonian Institute Astrophysical Observatory, and then they pipe in and they give me a paycheck. So I didn't receive any money. The contract is you between you and the Smithsonian. It had nothing to do with me. Okay, I have no, so, no such power. And then, of course, it is this kind of letter that they actually have not printed that particular quote that they, that they say. But you know what? I'm not very happy. We actually, Professor Legate, David Legate, wrote a letter to this guy and saying that, look, we noticed that Michael Mann, by the way, and then another guy by the name of Peter Glick. Peter Glick is a very famous guy, by the way. Joe Bass can tell you all about it because he actually uh, gave a, a stolen identity of who he is, stole stuff from a Heartland Institute internal memo, and then released all this stuff in public. Yet you cannot do anything to them, okay? This guy published in PNAS, claiming that they have no conflict of interest. These people clearly have a lot of conflict of interest, isn't it? Especially even in terms of their funding sources. And I was also unhappy. So I write a letter to him. What are you going to do? You have a loaded gun pointing at my head. You won't even point it away, take it away. I say, would you write a letter saying that nothing is happening now? They actually keep quiet, hiding like a little baby. Can you believe that? Editor-in-chief of the Proceeding National Academy of Science. I'm sorry, this is how much respect I can give you because you are not a normal human being and you're not practicing science. Shame on you. Then we got another case. I published a paper in Journal of Climate. This one is run by a group called American Meteorological Society. It's a very nice piece of work to study global monsoon, how it changes, okay? Monsoon system all over the world, that there is a concept called global monsoon. And we try to model it, and then uh, we try to see whether the sun has anything to do with it. So I happen to be the co-authors and expert helping out on the, on the solar aspect of the problem. And guess what the AMS did to me? They, uh, this one, they actually successfully put a yellow star on me. Less than, I would say, less than three weeks, they actually added an, uh, a corrigendum or some sort of thing like that, publisher note. They actually added this statement that I received money from a Southern Company for doing this. Remember, I am a four or fifth author of this thing now. My contribution is only in helping them to reply on why we should use certain solar forcing and that, stuff like that. I didn't even spend a dime on any of my funding. And they insist on putting things like this on this. This is really Nazi ter territory, put it this way. The word couldn't be anything less because these people keep doing things like this. 
And no matter how many times I tell them, actually, my lawyer's letter will be too late because they were rushing to this, okay? It's less than three weeks they were already printing this stuff, and they won't retract this sort of stuff. And now, if you want to see the shining example of uh, editors and peer review system, this is actually an, another one of those great stuff from the Climate uh, Gate email. Professor Michael Mann, being an editor of Journal of Climate, asking Phil Jones to review the paper of Ben Center and Tom Wigley. You can imagine, it's just quickly accepted. This is why these people are actually so proud of showing that I got 1,000 papers or whatever. You know, see if I give really, really bad people doing stuff like this. I want to ask Professor Obama to fix problem like this. This is actually a recent uh, case that a uh, major publisher have to retract more than 1,100 studies from a cancer research journal from fake peer review. System are so bad now, people are actually have no more ethics and moral. They're actually sending fake email to themselves, they review the paper and then send it back. These people got caught. It's a very common situation now. I'm very sorry that to, to tell this kind of story, but it's very ugly. And then as you all know, I also published a paper in, uh, in what this journal called Ecological uh, Complexity. We published a paper on polar bear. That was in 2007. But the controversy is not about the paper. The controversy is about this error that says that I am so powerful. Willis Soon, imagine Willis Soon published paper in polar bear can make the editor do this. That you send in 1st of March, you got accepted 2nd of March. My God, this Willis Soon is pretty good, isn't it? He's so good, he don't need no damn peer review, right? It's so bad that this misconception was out there. Those guys immediately attacked this sort of thing, obviously. But you know, you guys want to know the truth, right? Don't we all want to know the truth? The truth is that I submitted the paper in September 2005 and then it got published in 2000. No, December 2005, it got published in uh, uh, 2007. Uh, look at that quote. Yeah, look at that quote. The, but here you have a very honest editor-in-chief, Professor Barry, Barry Lee from UC Riverside. He actually issued a, 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 some form of a retraction in, uh, I guess, three years later, in 2010, say that that paper was submitted on December 14, and it was revised and tentatively accepted October 2006, finally on March 2nd, and then went online April 16, 2007. This is showing you the inertia in the system is pretty bad if you want to tell the truth, right? And nobody even trusts Willie Sun. I'm just simply saying this is what happened. You show them all the email, they don't care. They don't want to even look. Now I'll come down to another case. I'm almost there, by the way. But here's another problem. This is the paper I published in 2004. It is the paper that I have to tell you. I really got Michael Mann pants down. Sorry for the expression. He, write a very, very, he did a very, very bad thing, by the way. And then I published a paper, you, you see what he say. He actually hooked up with Gavin Schmidt, by the way, you're familiar with him, right? Goddard Institute of Space Studies, the director now. They were saying that, oh, we were talking so bad about high PCC. Instead of focusing on himself, he, he project again. We are criticizing his work. We're not talking about high PCC yet, okay? And then he keep insisting that I was the bad guy. I didn't know how to use statistics. Uh, it was not proper. It was not proper and standard statistic. You guys want to know what is this standard statistics they are doing? I'll show you, just a minute. First of all, I want to explain to you that I did publish a, an op-ed in a Tech Central Station, and I even explained the stuff that when our paper was scheduled to be published, it didn't appear, and I find it very strange. So I called the Editorial Office of American Geophysical Union, Ge Geophysical Research Letter. Oh, they say that they will complain about this paper uh, has a lot of copyright issues, so it shouldn't be published or shouldn't be published yet, unless you show it to us. And then, the last word of the phone, phone call was basically, we should not have taken Michael Mans for it, because I explained, I have gotten all the paperwork, and here it is, I'll show you. And they say, we should not have taken Michael Mans word for it. This is only my word, okay? But, look, look what happened. This is what happened. The problem in Michael Mann's paper is that, look, 2002, he published a result that is correct. You see the red curve? We were able to emulate what he did. But the last one, he really actually are showing the extreme warming at the rate of 1 to 2.5 degrees per decade, or 10 to 25 degrees Celsius per century. 25 degrees per century, this is unheard of, okay? Because the rate of change that he was doing. This is based on mathematical manipulation. This is what he calls standard statistics. They actually 
suppose to, if you actually have a, have a data that ends in, let's say, 2000, right? He actually have to add another, because he used a 40 years filter, he actually have to add additional 20 years of data to try to smooth it out so the endpoint is running at 2000 rather than, you know, like 1980. This is what he did. He add extra data to the front of it, and he call it standard, accepted practice. It is not accepted practice, I'm sorry. Okay? So, you see, he actually, we have a proof in the climate gate email showing that that's what he did. He actually was so proud that he write email among all his colleagues that he was almost able to prevent us from publishing. But of course, I was smart enough by that time, 2004. I was able to get all the stuff pre-approved and all the copyright done before that. So, to see how sad this guy is, he actually equating himself as a Holocaust survivor. He's equating himself as a Holocaust survivor, okay? This is the kind of stuff that is just crazy, actually. So my first conclusion, I do have five more minutes, so I'm going to use up all my time. The dark cloud of censorship and intimidation is sweeping across climate science and era in full display now. Climate science, as we know it, as we know it is dangerously invaded, corrupted by scientism. The big bad bullies of censorship, those scientific, scientists, scientific institution and funding agency continue to be calling shots and making decisions in just about any matter that is important to science, and that has to be stopped. I have an epilogue that I want to say. It's about funding, isn't it? Which really has nothing to do with whatever results you do. So in that kind of funding atmosphere, you say 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, right, Jane? I would say 4 plus 4 is equal to 27. Or 4 minus 4 is equal to 7 even, okay? Because you take the 2 away. Now I want to address this simple question. I'm going to jump into the, the, the medical science area. His name is Stanley Prusner. He was the sole Nobel Prize winner in physiology in uh, 1998 for the discovery of prion. But the story behind, behind why what he's doing this is actually has something to do with another of my hero, Professor Frederick Seitz. Okay? Because he was about to be fired assistant professor from University of San Francisco, California. No more funding to do his experiment. He wanted to find out about this prion, right? These bad proteins that is folding in a very weird shape, so it's causing a lot of problems like Macau disease. And Fred Seitz just pulled him aside, say how much money you want and get his experiment going. And then people were questioning the funding of science because it came from R.J. Reynolds. Okay, come from R.J. Reynolds. But I say, so what? That's what Fred Seitz say. As long as it was green, I'm not clear about this, uh, this moralistic issue, right? We had absolutely free reign to decide how we spend the money, what experiment we do. If they give the tobacco front cover, I will leave that to philosopher and priest. Not me, I'm a scientist, so am I. So here's what Stan Prusner should say how valuable that money is. That funding allowed him to do the experiment that led to that kind of discovery. You basically need 80 years of experiment to do it, to get the, you know, the sample and statistics right. You can do it in one year, okay? I'm very proud because Fred Sy is standing there. That was his 90th birthday. I was one of the young guys to get lucky to be invited to that kind of a nice, uh, fun evening. And then I want to say that, you know what, these people are promoting global warming. You guys, do you know that if you plot the CO2 and that, they have a very nice statistical correlation, isn't it? They really have a case, isn't it? I say no. <laughs> this is just not good enough, isn't it? To kill Alzheimer or send a man to the moon and bring him back, seriously. So we will leave that to, uh, of course, Matt Brick to address that. I would say that, you know, jellyfish survive for that many years. People are very proud. They give hope to many people. But on statistical correlation, I would say you might as well talk about winning, winning letters, winning work in national spelling bees versus the people being killed by a venomous spider in U.S. Since we're in U.S., we should talk about the spending, U.S. spending on science, space, and technology, and the number of lawyers in Louisiana. They are kind of correlated, isn't it? Very strongly correlated. But that is not science, guys. That is not science. Absolutely not science. Here, let me show you what is science. Science shows you that this is actually the, the, the normalized cost of the, the, the money in terms of producing per unit energy of light power to shine ourselves, to read, to be able to enjoy nightlife, right? It drops so drastically until the modern time. This is what the result of science and technology. And then CO2, it is an illusion, by the way. Do you guys know which one is the illusion? Oh, it's a delusion. And then we got this stuff that is kind of weird and uh, hypnotizing. My last conclusion is, I have more to say. Please give me another two, three minutes. 
Nearly all institutions are essentially populated and controlled by activists and alarmists rather than curious scientists that are firmly convinced of the great harms of CO2 without any needs for interest for, or scientific evidence. Something I want to remind you about my, my real joy of science is actually meeting scientists like this. I want to show you my results. Okay? It's about the sun. This is my latest result that has been published. It's showing you a plot of the northern hemisphere composite of the temperature curve and what the sun's irradiance is doing. We don't live in the northern hemisphere. We want to look at what USA is doing, don't we? The US Global Change Research, you should look at this curve. That is the US temperature curve, but guess what? Temperature thermometer data has been corrupted by a lot of this urban problem and what you call non-climatic factors. Could be just the time you observe them, what time you observe every day. And we actually took the rural station and very carefully go through the station history and come up with this rural temperature curve for the US temperature history. And here's our solar irradiance curve. I would contend that at least the proposition that the sun affects the temperature in the US is still very, very good. But what's the real reason for doing that, for being able to do that? Actually, I found the answer too. I just published this one because I want to remind you. It has something to do with water vapor. The blue curve now is the water vapor. This is not a direct measurement, by the way. This is still a model output, but the model can do something very simple called the clasius clapeyron uh, water vapor relation. So you are able to produce a curve like this is quite close correlation. Now I'm going to take two more minutes to remember two very great friends that just passed away. Indeed, I'm old enough now to really appreciate life. Two of these friends of mine just suddenly passed away that indeed very well captured by this quote. Man exists less by the facts he performed during his life than by the weeks that he lived behind him like a shooting star. Here I want to remember Professor Bob Carter. We just published a volume to, to, in honor of his name that just come out in uh, Australia uh, Institute for Public Affairs. If anybody interested in the book, please look for me. Just help them out. Of course, we don't pay, make any money. Again, sorry, the, uh, my wife. <laughs> And then another great friend of mine just died suddenly, Professor Itzman Marco from Belgium. He's from the uh, University of uh, Catholic of uh, Louvain. And uh, in fact, he was about to invite me to talk about orbital forcing at his university because uh, we just provide a great solution and a really new solution to that problem where his institution produced the world best uh, output ever. So we thought we could actually arrange for that talk. Unfortunately, it may not happen right now. So thank you very much, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>